Welcome back to another episode of Book Ears. Today, we are very fortunate because we have a guest. The lovely Agnes Gomelian is here to join us. And as always, we have the lovely April. Hello. And Iris. Iris is here. And we are going to be talking about how an audiobook gets delivered, the process of publishing. And so it's so exciting that we have an actually published author. Look at us. We're so professional. We have professional authors on the show. <laughs> we just easy. Michelle just knew one and she just called her up. Well, messaged. <laughs> well, you know, so, so good. <laughs> yeah, is it is it the record thing. keeper or just record keeper? Because sometimes the record keeper. It looks like it comes up with just record keeper and then sometimes Ooh. the record keeper. Interesting. No, it's the record keeper. I'm naming Erica. Erica is a rec. She is the record keeper that I'm talking about in the book. Oh. And as is our way, we started with our signature cocktail. Today we have the Erica Cobain, spelled like the character with an A R A A R I K A Cobain. Mm -hmm. It is a butterscotch moonshine drink because there isn't any fruit in the book. And I like a fruity cocktail. I need it to be sweet. And there was no fruit except for the one little piece of fruit that she had the whole time. So I figured they probably didn't, you know, have fruit to spare for cocktails. And then mm -hmm. the one time they mentioned alcohol that I can recall in the, in the book, they just called it alcohol. So obviously yes. it was moonshine. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. That'll work. <laughs> it would have had to have been something that they made homemade. Right. You know? Themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So moonshine. And then uh, we put it in a mule, made it a mule with the ginger beer because I figured they do have spices. And uh, she was very stubborn. Erica yeah, Cobain. very mulish character. That very Erica. This is such a well thought out drink. Like I didn't even think about that when you explained the drink to me, but that's exactly right. This is the kind of drink that they would drink. So yeah. So that is, we have the Erica Cobain, which is a butterscotch moonshine with ginger beer and a cinnamon stick, mostly so that we have a third ingredient because we can't just have two <laughs> ingredients. That would be wrong. Because while Erica was a very complex character, the drink is very simple. It's pretty simple. All right. And it's pretty tasty. I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite yummy. I'm enjoying it. I, I was like surprised. The cinnamon. I like the cinnamon with it. Really? You can taste the cinnamon. Did you like shave it at all? Or did you just put the, I just put it right in. I have shaving. Sorry. Oh, that's probably, that's probably a better way to do it. Yeah. I used it as a swizzle stick. And then uh, it's been macerating for about 40 <laughs> minutes Ew. waiting on the episode to start. So I do get the uh, a little heat from the cinnamon in it. I like uh -huh. it. Yeah. You guys are making me jealous that I just have wine. I should have gotten some. Now yeah. I feel bad. Well, you can always oh. get one later. Get the ingredients and it when the episode delicious. when the episode sounds... airs, you'll you can drink it okay, in perfect, celebration. Perfect. That's right. That's exactly what I'll do. That that sounds good. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the preconceptions of how books get published. And when I was doing some research, I happened upon this wonderful tweet by Jason Printer. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's an author. He wrote a book called A Stranger at the Door. But the tweet was just right up my alley. So I thought I would share that to start, start us all off. So he says, there's lots of false information going around about publishing. So here's the truth about how it really works. So step one is finish the draft of a book. Well, that checks out, right? Mm -hmm. Step two is to email the book to Oprah, which <laughs> I, I feel like that's probably a good way to do it. Because step three is for Oprah to design the cover. Well, that, which she's probably yeah. very good at. Step four is for Oprah to deliver the book to Steven Spielberg. Right? Step five <laughs> is for right. Steven Spielberg to print copies of the book. Okay, um, I'm writing these. I had no idea it was this easy. Okay, go ahead. It's really easy. Step this six, is the most direct path. There are other paths, but this is the direct path to actually getting published. Step so, six is for Reese Witherspoon to come over, take the book directly from Stephen, and drive them all over the country to bookstores. So they mm -hmm. hand deliver mm -hmm. these books to the bookstores for you. Apparently, <laughs> this is a service that she provides. Then the author goes on the Today Show wearing a flattering outfit that brings up the color in their eyes. Now, that's very important. You don't want to wear an outfit that just minimizes your eyes. You no. know, you need them to. Why pop. would you? No. Right. No. And then step, <laughs> step eight is a movie adaptation starring Ryan Reynolds comes out the very next week. 
approximately one week after the first draft of the book is completed. Mm -hmm. The author finishes the first draft of the next book and then sends that directly to Jeff Bezos as a better beta reader. If Jeff Bezos likes the book, he would then put it on Amazon. Now, the author's agent and editor, I don't know how the author got these, to be honest with you, because we just skipped, it must have happened somewhere between four and five. But the agent and the editor will then take the author out to Las Vegas and rent out the Bellagio to celebrate. Step 11 approves casting for sequel to a movie based on a book, replacing Ryan Reynolds with Charlize Theron, which I actually think is a good casting call because, you know, she's kind of a badass. Right? <laughs> I mean, Ryan Reynolds is cute and all, but no one can hit a bitch like Charlize Theron, is all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Then the author finishes the second draft of the book and sends that to Oprah. And then the author secures an author contract to manufacture and distribute author brand tequila. The author leaves her spouse and marries Idris <laughs> Albus or Charlize Theron. Yes. Or both. What step is that? Wow. That's step 14. <laughs> Agnes is like, I just want to skip to that one. (laughs) (laughs) And then step 15, which is the last step, is uh, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, purchased the author for $2.2 billion. So this sounds like it's a pretty cut and dried (laughs) way for it to happen. And Jason Printer, who is an author, a published author, has got it all figured out. That's amazing. I love that list. So yeah, I'm surprised that more authors just don't take that direct path. I mean, what are, what are they doing? I took the meandering path. But you are on Amazon. Hey. Yeah. (laughs) And somehow also in the libraries, which I. No interest, Alba. (laughs) Yet. You're pacing yourself. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So what, what are some of the things that you guys think about or thought when you think about getting a book published? Like before you got it published, like what was the ideas that you had? Well, I think for me, in my mind, I just always pictured, you know, like typewritten manuscripts that are like three inches thick and uh, you mail them out to like 200 publishers (laughs) and then you get like uh, the thin envelope in the mail where they're like, thank you for your contribution, but you know, we don't have room for you at this time <laughs> until the one, the one that you really wanted, they mm-hmm. see you. And that's all it takes, <laughs> but you have to cry I, a lot first. You, know, you, ha- <laughs> you have to be rejected many, many times, right? No one just gets published their first time out you know, and if you are, then, you know, it's, you don't really get street cred for that. Okay. (laughs) Oh, Uh oh. this is such a funny question because I'm trying to remember when I didn't know how publishing worked, because one thing about me is I'm very heavy into research. So when I thought I might want to get published, I immediately looked it up. So it's like just Googling it. (laughs) And then there's so many people discuss the subject that, um, you know, it's pretty easy to find the process. So you can, there's some outliers, but the basic process of, if you want to be traditionally published, you need an agent first. If you want an agent, you got to do this, this, and this. And no agent asks for a half done manuscript. So the first thing you have to do is finish your manuscript. So in your case, which came first? Did you have the book finished and you started researching it? Or you just knew that you had this story in you and you were going to, you know, be writing it and you knew that you wanted to be published and you did the research to kind of help guide you before you even started? Ladies, this is like 14 years ago. So I'm honestly (laughs) trying to remember. I was, well, the way I, I've always written I've, I, I've always had a, a poetry book or a journal, or I wrote my first uh, fan fiction when I was in like sixth grade. So writing- oh, What was always, it, Agnes? It was a romance novel. Of, <laughs> I, I hoarded romance novels. I had them stuffed yeah. like underneath my bed. I went to a fundamentalist Christian church. And so romance novels were not allowed. So I would rip the covers right. off and like stuff them in like crazy <laughs> places. <laughs> And so, yeah, we, we had a, we had a whole episode about romance novels, oh, we did. Really? so we can relate. Yes. So what was, what was your genre of romance? I liked, um, you know, anything bodice ripping. 
Oh, okay. I was like 10. (laughs) This is really bad. What happened was my cousin uh, lived with us and she was older and she was in romance. So I just sort of like got the books that she left around and ripped off the covers and went around with them. And she liked, um, honestly, I read anything I could get my hands on, but like uh, Regency romance, anything just... uh, yeah <laughs> yeah same in april yeah i like the historical romance mm-hmm. historical yes romance, for yeah. sure and so then what happened um okay so so i've got it so basically i've always written never thought of writing as a job my my i always i went to law school so i always thought of you know writing is just something i i enjoyed doing right. and it wasn't until my uh after my second summer of law school, it was during my second summer of law school when I realized I did not want to be a lawyer. I hated, like I literally broke out in hives going to oh. the um, the firm that I worked for that I was like, I want to do something else. But writing really didn't super cross my mind even at that point. But but in order to, to process the f- emotions I was having at this uh with this, with all the, you know, just the issues of not wanting to do what I've just committed my life to doing, I started writing to do that. I wrote right. a story about a young woman who, uh, who left, who climbed out of a window because she was so trapped in by her life. She hadn't, she was at a, just went to a wedding and she just felt so trapped in by all the different things that everybody wanted from her that she went to the bathroom and climbed out of the window. And that was the beginning, the first line of my, of my first novel you know post that fan fiction and so I wrote that book just sort of trying to get the idea out and then I immediately started trying to figure out how to publish a book so right after I started writing right after I started right after I realized you know what writing could be something I I might actually want to do I researched it so I don't know if there was ever a point where I imagined writing when I had when I didn't you know immediately go and figure out how to do it right so yeah I don't know if that's that's an interesting answer but did you get that book published as well that book is not published you know what that book was about my fundamentalist Christian upbringing and I'm still like right before I got on this call I was having like a, a fundamentalist Christian you know trauma episode so I'm still processing so much of what happened during that time in my life, I'm not ready to write that book yet, but right. it will be a book that I write eventually. So I wrote that book, another book, and I wrote two books before I wrote The Record Keeper. The second one was a romance, a very short romance. And the third one I wrote was The Record Keeper. And as soon as I wrote it, I knew I wanted to get that one published officially. I thought I was ready to publish. Oh, and so. you were. Yes. Oh, thank you. So one thing that I've always been curious about when you finish a book, mm-hmm. how do you know that you're finished? You know, Mm. like even, even that short romance book, do you ever Mm. think, oh, I just wish I could do that over again? Always. There's never really finished. The characters for me are very, very haunting. And so I wonder what's going to happen to Erica after I'm done writing the second book. Because after that... When are oh, we getting what? the second book? Like, when is that happening? Because you left me it in got place. Pushed back. It got I've been pushed left back. in a place. It's now September. It's now September <laughs> of next year. Oh, when you are left in a place. But I'm left in a book, place. <laughs> the next book sort of wraps wait, it wait, up. Wait, 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 wait. Next Ugh. year? Like 2022? Oh, no, no, no. 2021 oh. of this year. September of this year. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm actually interested to see the first two characters. Eliza was my first character. She's still with me because I haven't written her book. The second character, the, the young man from that character is actually getting his own book later on in, in oh. the series that I'm writing. So in, in, in the third book with The Record Keeper, and I'm very interested to see now that I've published both of Erica's stories, once I publish both of Erica's stories, what happens to her? Does she just continue to haunt me? Because I assume the other two are haunting me because I haven't written their stories yet. Right. So I, I have no idea what happened. You don't to know how to say goodbye. After. You do not know how to say goodbye. Oh, closure. I don't know. I honestly don't know because they're so part of you. Not. They're oh, they're absolutely part of me. Yeah, but I would think they're not going to have the same like sort of clawing, gnawing at you, sort of like do something, sort of prodding you to do something. But I, I honestly don't know because I haven't finished. So you're so, so, you, so, so you'll be like at the grocery store and the cashier will say something and you'll be like, that's so Erica. <laughs> 
I can't imagine <laughs> the Erica at a grocery store. You, like, but I, like, do you do you meet people that they remind you of your character? You be like, that sounds like something. Such a good question. How am I when I say haunted? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is certain emotions will let me know that Erica has felt that too. Is that weird? I don't no. know if that even makes any sense. I've never said that out loud before. But like, I'll feel something. It'll be such a deep, like, 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 for example, like my husband will say something that uh, makes me feel afraid or trapped in for something for, you know, I just, I feel this like, like really guttural feeling. And, and I'll be like, that's what Erica was trying to say. When I was writing that scene, that's what she was feeling. She was feeling like, hey, don't box me in or hey, back away from me. And so that's the sort of, like, it's almost like there's something, ah, oh, this is such a great question. <laughs> it's like, Eric is a part of me, is probably what it is. Well, Eric is a, it's an unresolved part of my own heart. Yeah, you're working so. some things out through your characters. In yeah. fact, it almost sounds like if you didn't have your characters, you might have multiple personality disorder. <laughs> you know what? I am not going to disagree with that. And my husband has probably said that before. It's, 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 I wouldn't disagree with that at all. It's a different way. Like there are different little pieces of me that I haven't quite, I'm not able to express. And so that's why when I feel that feeling, I'm like, that's what Erica was feeling weird that's a little weird okay I, I <laughs> feel free to cut that <laughs> I don't think it's weird I think it's fascinating I think it is too. and oh, and man. and and very healthy to be honest you know yeah I mean it's yeah. a good way to manage stuff write it write it out yeah and you know what that's what I've always used my writing for I literally just connected that right now I've always used my writing to sort of work out what's going on with me and my poetry I've always had a diary I've always had it with me so, um, so yeah, that's probably exactly what I'm doing. Thanks guys. <laughs> Free do, you, <laughs> do you, do you write longhand or are you all, you that's know, a good question too. I wrote my first book longhand. I started the parts of the record keeper. I wrote longhand, but writing is a business too. And that longhand is not going to get it done in the long run. So I, right now I do both. I have a little book, a little tiny book where I write down random things. And right now, because I have two kids, I mostly write on my phone, believe it or not. Most of the seed of Cain was written on my cell phone because wow. this is the one thing I can do with one finger while I'm holding my son or while I'm, you know, at a stoplight. I literally write within, you know, two minutes, I sit down and do something. So, um, so yeah, so some longhand, I wish I could write a longhand. Maybe one day I'll get back to that, but not so much now. Do you have nice yeah. handwriting? No, that's, a, that's part of the reason why I had to switch over. Cause I was like, I have no idea. This was a good scene. I have no idea what I said. I felt, I feel it. I was like crying as I was writing. So I have no idea what I said. So no, terrible handwriting. <laughs> Same. Yeah. And mine gets worse as I go. Like it starts off. Yeah. Okay. But then after like the first paragraph, it's illegible. What's really funny is mine starts off in one way. I like start writing in all caps and then it'll switch to cursive as if different personalities are, See? are coming out. There you so go. There's a lot going on inside. <laughs> I can just remember anyway. being so embarrassed uh, senior year of high school because, you know, you would uh, address your invitations to your graduation. Mm -hmm. And my handwriting was so terrible. And like my mm -hmm. sister's handwriting is beautiful. And I have so many friends with beautiful handwriting. And I just always wanted that. But no, no. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the record keeper, when you gave it to the publisher and you had to have it, uh, an editor had to review it, mm -hmm. did they have you change anything in the book? Yes. <laughs> Oh, that yes. must have been, how did you feel about that? It, my feelings on it changed. <laughs> um, at first, I, you know, my process to publish, I'm a black woman for anybody. I don't know if this is the podcast, they might not have Googled me, but I'm an African-American woman and my agent is a white man. And my editor, my first editor for the record people was a white man. Oh. And so the barrier to trying to get some of the things that I that I thought were obvious that Erica was feeling or thinking and why she would think that they would ask questions like why is she feeling that way I'm like well obviously because he just said this <laughs> and they're like no I don't get that so you'd have to have to break down certain 
uh, responses that I would think, uh, I, I personally understood why she was saying or doing that. So, or why, what in her history would have led to this particular action? But a lot of the times they did not understand. And because these men are gatekeepers, you had to change it or because, you know, maybe it's because it was my first book. A lot of times it was like, it felt like, well, if I don't change it, I don't want, you know, I want my book to be published. I want this. And so eventually maybe my, when I'm Stephen King, (laughs) I'm never going to be Stephen King, but when I have a little bit more clout, maybe I could say, no, I'm keeping this. But at the time I, I did feel I had a few things that I wanted to hold on to. I was like, no one's gonna make me change these ideas. But everything else I was pretty flexible on because I knew I was trying to enter this world that's very difficult to enter. And they're gatekeepers, that's just the fact of it. Whether they're racist, whether they're sexist, they are there. And if I wanna enter that world and change it, I've got to do some, you know, you gotta do a little bit of whatever it's called. I don't know what you call it, but pay your dues sort of. That's kind of heavy, Agnes. Thanks yeah, for. Am I heavy? I'm heavy. <laughs> that was kind of a lot like Erica in the in the book. Yes, I was just thinking. Erica in the book is constantly trying to follow the rules to make changes, and then coming up against these terrible barriers that that but it doesn't work out for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and she does a lot of what I said too. She yeah, kind of she like, does. Okay, I guess I'll have to do it this way, but maybe one day when I have some power, yeah, exactly. I'll be able to do it differently. Yeah, it's very. Yeah. It, it just yeah. Me yeah, but that. what ha- you know, what did Erica learn that following the rules and making those changes and those compromises, thinking that she was pleasing the person with power, the person with power is shit. What's your editor's name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary, if you're listening, I told you my feelings evolved because what I actually learned as an adult Maybe Erica is like one of my little children working herself out. But because one of the things I've learned as an adult is that you had, this was such a beautiful thing about the editing process. Gary chose my book out of a pile. He could have picked any book he wanted to in the world to publish and somebody would have been grateful. So he chose my book because he liked my book. And so when he was pushing back against me, he wasn't against me. He was actually for me trying to help me. And so having him on my, knowing that he was literally on my side made it so the comments that he made, I had to stop and just do more explaining, which Mm -hmm. I think if I was a white man, I wouldn't have had to explain as much, but I just had to like take his hand sort of and like walk him through. (laughs) And he was wonderful about it. So as I went further along, even in the record keeper, I got more gumption and more like you know, Gary, I think you can get this one if I walk you through it. So I had to stop and explain more. Like in my comments in Microsoft Word would be like a page <laughs> of comments. Oh, this is why she did this. And this is about African-American history. And this is why she, you know, and right. he was really willing to go along with me, which I think is probably the tack, the toll of being a black and a woman. You got to do a little bit more work to get there. But Gary, in the end, uh, he picked my book, you know, and other, and I, I gave my book to many black women. And they did not pick my book out of a pile. So I've got to, on some level, say thank you, Gary, for seeing Erica. You may not have seen her completely, but you saw her value. And, and, I, and I thank him for that in the end, even if he wasn't perfect. That's a beautiful so. thing to say. Yeah. Yeah, because you're right. Whatever struggles he had, he saw something and he supported it. Mm-hmm. And in his, probably his intention was any changes were only to make it more palatable for the mm-hmm. masses, you know, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, cause your success at that point is his success, you know? Mm-hmm. And he allowed me to fight with him. He really, we fought, we went back and forth like six times on these things. I was like, but Gary, <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I was wrong. I, I think he edited the book very well. Right. So, um, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I have no, no regrets that how who 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 uh the universe chose to to uh help me through this process so you did get a pretty good i mean th- your book is packaged pretty well right because you were you're in the library system you're on audible <laughs> you're in amazon you're in the bookstores like like mm-hmm. your book is so accessible mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. a first time author that's mm-hmm. pretty amazing right or yeah no, it's, it's actually really wonderful. My book is published by Titan Books in 
in London, but it's distributed by Penguin Random House. Right. So it's basically, and being distributed by Penguin Random House means that um, basically Titan is a client of Penguin Random House. So all the books that Titan wants to publish in America, they basically give it to the Penguin Random House team of distributors and uh, publicists. I have like my own Titan publicist, but then I have a team of publicists over at Penguin Random House too. And they, they basically, that's why it's everywhere. That's why it's in the Library of Congress. Like it's a very accessible, wonderful, like I love the system because it gives me a very small publishing house feel with Titan books. Like I've talked to my, my editor is a senior editor. I have like the publisher or the, um, like the top people at, at Titan email right. me. And that would never happen at Penguin Random House. So I get sort of the best of both worlds. And that's, I will stay with Titan. I like, I, I really love this publisher. So because of that. No, the book cover, I'm just curious. Was that yours or did you guys all collaborate together? I mean, that's, that's a nice cover. I love my book cover. And it was such a, like the one thing that I said is please don't put, cause I heard these horror stories of like the girl being African-American in the story and on the cover, she's like super light skinned and blonde, like crazy stories like that. Like they will switch it just for publicity purposes. Cause they think that women walking on the, in Target won't look at an African-American person in the book and want to pick it up. And so they'll change the person's race on the front of the book or hide it in some way. So that was my one request, which again was me going in sort of like, guys, I know I'm just here. Can you please, you know, it was like, I was very small and afraid. But then Julie, she is this amazing artist, amazing cover artist. And she asked me, I did not have any sort of approval or anything over the cover, but she asked me like, you know, what are the things that I thought were interesting about the book? And I was like, well, I have this bird motif. All, you know, Erica says, I, I, I came out singing you know mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. like a canary and and then throughout the book you know erica's name is air she's flying to erica and then jetson is, is a fast mover and um you know kiwi which is a little baby like fuzzy bird like uh like kiwi in the book uh he's he has a lot of hair <laughs> and there's fount which is like bubbling up like a fountain so all these names and invoke inside of me this 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 desire this african-american desire to be uncaged and to spread our wings and to be who we were meant to be despite racism and so i i expressed that to her and then she came up with this amazing cover about how you know the birds leaving the earth and being able to take flight so that was all her imagination and me sort of putting that bug in her ear about that motif that i have throughout the book it was beautiful, amazing. Well, I'm Very glad beautiful. that you. I'm glad that you brought out, up the names of your characters, mm -hmm. because that's something that throughout the book, when I was reading it, I felt like I was so close to figuring out some sort of secret naming <laughs> convention that you had for the characters, but I never could figure it out. So mm -hmm. is there some deeper meaning to how you picked the name for the characters? Was there a pattern? Yeah, the, the Congos are all, they're birds. They're, they're African-American people. And with throughout African-American literature, the African-American canon, there's, I know why the caged bird sings. There's these ideas that if we were just given the opportunity, you would have no idea how big we could fly. And so, I, I, I didn't stick to all birds, but the idea of movement, the idea that these people want to be free, they want to move more freely is in there. So you have Pidge, which is like a pigeon. Hosea is Hosea, but they call him Ka. Like, and that's right. the sound that a bird makes when you're calling for help, which is who Hosea is, a person that comes and helps you. So that was sort of the convention. And all my characters, um, after Erica, there's other I have Egret coming. I have Kira Swan is the the uh, woman in my second book. So yeah, they're they're named after movements. Um, I love that, but I'll I'll be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not very pleased with you and how Hannibal was treated oh. in the book. Ooh. I that that left. I'm still processing that. I can't believe mm -hmm. that Erica having, you know, been in the pit knowing mm -hmm. what was coming could just leave. Yeah. I've just 
and this is something Michelle and I've talked about before because Michelle really relates to Erica and the mm-hmm. rule following and the belief yeah. that if you do everything that's prescribed, then you will get the, there's a formula. You do A, B, you get C. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I, and she sympath- empathizes with those characters and I mm-hmm. do not. And I yes. just, I was so frustrated with her, mm-hmm. you know, I, and I'm drawing a blank on the, her rival's name. Covington? Covington, yes. Covington, Covington yeah. is who I got. I yes. was like, Co- I want Covington's book. To be the, <laughs> yeah, to be the, he- the heroine. I, I hear you. Michelle, I would love for you to explain why you got Erica, because I can explain her, obviously, but I would love to understand, because this is the dichotomy that I face almost every single talk. Why doesn't Covington have a book? And Erica's so awful. How could she do that? And then there's other people who get her. I love love Erica. I mean, Mm -hmm. I really related to her as a character Mm -hmm. because like a a lot of the things that she does, even even though I was mad at her, in the moment, like, I feel like I probably would have done the same thing because it's safe to follow the rules. Like she, she was not in a safe place at all. And anytime she went out of the rules, she was immediately physically wounded. And mm-hmm. she had all of this determination and all of this work that she put in. So like the momentum was to follow the rules, to get it going so that she could get to the Congress. If she could just get mm-hmm. to the Congress and she could fix it. She could change it. So she's fixated on this goal. And then all of these other goals or some things that were happening that she could fix them in post kind of, you know, mm-hmm. like I understood, I understood that, like, cause that's how I live my life. I'm very mm-hmm. much about the rules. And then sometimes Hi, I'm like, okay, this, about the rules. <laughs> this rule needs to be I changed. And I'm like, before I even try it. Yeah. There's that's a right exactly. way. There's a right way to change it. I got to go mm-hmm. and I got to write my Congressman and I got to, you know, go to the, like, you know, being bad is not the way to change it. You know, like that's mm-hmm. totally me. Although I understand yeah. more now as I get older, how and how more mm-hmm. and more and more that's not realistic. Like you have to mm-hmm. occasionally the, the rules are wrong. Yeah, and exactly. Then you have to stop and doing I, the and rules. Erica's Which Erica gets People at the end, right? She's 17. She does. That's okay, but you know who else is 17? Covington. Covington, yeah. Okay, so here's, here's, where, <laughs> here's what I was thinking when I wrote it. First of all, I told you I grew up fundamentalist Christian. And if there's right? anything about fundamentalist Christianity is you follow the rules or you go to actual hell. So right. there's like this, when you get taught from a very young age that the only other option is death and hell, so it doesn't matter how bad, you know, the rules are. It's like, well, is it worse than dying? Uh, you know, and, and maybe as you get older, and that's what I think Erica learned, because when she's seven, you, she's by that window. I don't know if y'all remember the part where Jones teaches her her lesson, is what I call it in the book. Jones physically beats her as a seven-year-old. She keeps standing up and saying, I can do this. And Jones pushes her back down. No, yeah. I can do this. And then she turned and, and, and eventually she's like, the pain's just too bad. If I don't say, okay, she's going to kill me. And then what, what will happen? And, and she doesn't know. This is hard for me. And so she goes and, and at that scene, if you read what I wrote, she stands up and the tears are tracing her lines like jowls. You know, she, 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 the tears go down her face like this because she's She's realizing that maybe the person that she was born to be this, you know how she was when she was born. She was calling like a canary. Comrades, come. Yes, to me. me." That's who she was. But then Joan taught her that if she is that person, she will not survive here on earth. And so this little kernel of fear got put down inside of her when she was seven before she ever had any power to actually be anything different than that. And that kernel grew and grew and grew over the next 10 years. And at the end of the book, she obviously goes and finds her little girl, the little girl sitting there, you know, mm-hmm. you know, trying to, you know, maintain herself. And, 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 and she wraps her arm. This is how she learns to fight Joan. She wraps her arm around this little girl and the girl wraps her arm around their waist. And, it, and I wrote, she, they rise up together. And that's when she's able to actually you know, fight Jones and actually, and then what she says at then is I have learned, I've come to a place where I was no longer afraid to die. Like you can kill me, kill me now. My hands are tied. My back is against the wall. I would rather die than live another day like this. And that's the moment where fear 
you, it's now p- longer powerful over you. And that's what she learns. And I actually could imitate that off of a uh, Frederick Douglass, which is a, 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 a African-American hero of mine in his slave narrative. He talks about becoming a free man when he was still in bondage. Like he, the, he thinks the moment he became free or he believes the moment he became free was seven years before he ever escaped to the North. Because the moment you become actually free is the moment that fear no longer can hold you down and you are willing to die for what you believe in. So, so that's what she learns. Well, she does learn that, but mm-hmm. the part that I, that was hard for me, like mm-hmm. I said, like with Hannibal, because mm-hmm. I, why was, you know, it more mm-hmm. of a catalyst for her when Kiwi died, which who didn't love Kiwi? I get that. But why was that the catalyst more than Hannibal, who had always been, who was, you know, more a part of her entire history and had always mm-hmm. been so sweet and kind? Why? I I think the reason why, and this is just me, I want to say guessing, even though I know I wrote the character, I think the reason <laughs> why is she just wasn't ready yet. You know, like there's, like, you want to say, I don't know if you've ever experienced something in your life where you're like, is it's just like it's what's the way to say it like you're not ready to get married so you're ready to get married you can meet like a million great guys but until right. you're ready to get married until you have evolved into a person that's ready to get married it really doesn't matter what it is so it wasn't an outside force that gave erica the catalyst it was erica going deep inside and addressing herself that was the catalyst so so but that's a that's a good question because i and hannibal gets back in there a little bit wait till the second book hannibal okay Hannibal <laughs> comes back a little bit. I mean, she, she has a little bit of power, but I, I hear what you're saying. And I get that. I get that all the time. People are frustrated by Erica. She, she makes, in a, it, she makes, I'm not going to say wrong. Cho- she, she chooses wrong. Yeah, Maybe she, I will say I she mean, chooses wrong over and over. But that's part she, of she what's goes. going to be great about it though, is that you can choose wrong for mm-hmm. more than once over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I don't, Michelle loves it as much as I do. You mm-hmm. can still be redeemed. You know? I love Amen. a redemption arc. It's my favorite. Unless you've it. been there, unless you've been in a place where mm-hmm. you're really afraid <laughs> yep. and the world has been shaped that way for you, it's hard to get. But that's yep. a lot of what African-American people experience on a regular basis. So that was one of the messages I wanted to be able to bring to the world. But honestly, I think a lot of, it, it's not just an African-American message. I think women... I think some fundamentalist Christians, I think men can be in a place where they can't be anything other than what society has told them to be. Sure. Right. So well, I, I think too, I mean, cause it's obviously PTSD, you know, she, yeah, there's definitely obviously. some trauma. I mean, she's definitely had some terrible things happen to her. Mm-hmm. It's basic child abuse. She was young and she was abused as a child and, and mm-hmm. the trauma she's she went through shaped her. But, mm-hmm. it, and it, so, but it was even more than that though, because it wasn't just like, trauma that many people go through in their childhood with like their family she was also it was the systemic you know being Mm -hmm. part of a cog in this vast machinery of oppression Mm -hmm. and denying Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. of their their own self sense of self you know and then and then that whole thing with the first brothers and second brothers you're Mm -hmm. acknowledging them as brothers yeah Mm -hmm. but you're still ranking you know significance yeah and there were different abuses like voltaire had her own ordeal Mm -hmm. what what made her she was i mean Mm -hmm. each each person even even the terrible awful person the teacher even she had a moment where that michelle thank you (laughs) even she had that moment where you kind of like see why she is who she is like it doesn't justify no way we're not gonna be jones apologists no 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 it doesn't justify i'm I'm not saying it but there was a moment where she explains when to to erica like you can be all these things and i can't and so that's Mm -hmm. why she hates her and you kind of understand but how but the, the thing that's so deep about it though is you can see how adults can be so you know close-minded and wrapped up in needing to protect their their themselves from really seeing themselves mm-hmm. with other adults but i can ne- i've never been able to see how an adult can look at a child and mm-hmm. be able to inflict that sort of cruelty yeah. there's a race issue here too um if you look back at at, at uh go back and study their the plantation dynamics 
where you have this master. All of us were subject. All, we're all white, white and black women. We were all subject to this white man who was the master of the plantation. And he would rape, you know, slaves. But in exchange for raping them, they got favors. And so then they would, you know, in some ways be above his wife or, you know, the white woman right. on the plantation. And then that created this horrific dynamic where a white woman was actually jealous of a slave because right. they were fighting over power that this white man had hoard, had been hoarding this whole time. So, and this would be, I mean, you talk about ages. This is a 17 year old slave and, and, a, and a grown woman who has had children of her own and has the, a plant as a plantation, you know, she has right. seems to have all these things. But when you look deeper into her life, you know, Jones was a brilliant woman. She was the valedictorian of her school. So why is she down here not being able to choose her, her way? Because up in the North, men are in charge. And so in a way, they are the same. But it's just such misdirected anger. It it's like what, you mm -hmm. know, I've never understood women who get mad at the other women when mm -hmm. their man cheats. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. The other woman didn't make you a promise. That man mm -hmm. made you a promise. I think so that... why are you putting everything you know find the right people to be mad at people i think that there's a there's a a risk in being mad mm -hmm. at like there, there's a risk in being mad at the person in charge because mm -hmm. a it doesn't do you any good mm -hmm. and b you can't get any satisfaction from it whereas mm -hmm. if you're mad at the woman right mm -hmm. you can you know destroy her name or whatever you can do things to her whereas with the man if you get mad at him and you sever that relationship then you've severed that relationship and then you lose something granted you, you may not have much to lose forget, but yeah. yeah but your whole life like you you you've, I mean, now we, you've, you've given up your job to raise your kids this is even modern day america i hear yeah. my husband's a, is a doctor so i'm on groups where people women are doctor wives and i'm telling you ladies they will give up their whole situation they got a PhD and have not done a single thing in, in working their PhD because they've been staying at home for 15 years. And so they are terrified, as smart as they are, to have their husband leave because what are they going to do with their three kids? How are they going to go get another job? The work environment is not made for divorcees. They're made for men and women, perhaps, but who, who go in very young and work their way up. So there's, it's not just that they just don't know who to blame. It's Michelle, you're right. They, they who, how they don't have any power to blame the, the system. I mean, everybody but, wants to be Katniss, right? Who I volunteer <laughs> for tribute. <laughs> yeah, but how? But how many? And this is where I get. This is where I get a little unpopular. Well, I think oh, no, no. you are but, also an independent woman who's. Well, that's what I get. How many times? I get that sometimes women is you know they have their power stripped. But what's mm -hmm. frustrating is so many women give their power away. Mm -hmm. That is what I have no tolerance for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Well, it's it's that's even tough too. I hate to say, <laughs> April, first of all, you're a better human than than me. So this is I'm not arguing with you like on a reality level. You shouldn't give your power away. But it, it, it when you you're born into a system where power is given, it's not like you were the one that decided that you would be a woman. And being a woman means you have to be this, this, and this. And being beautiful means you have to be. It's no one, no one. We were all born into a system where white men are at the top of the food chain, and 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 so it's not necessarily giving your power away. In a way, it's sort of an exchange. Like you, you give yourself, hoping that they will cover you with their power, so you can move up the chain. <laughs> is what you're doing. I don't know. I mean, you think about these women with the PhDs and they get married and then they decide not to use their PhDs. They're just going to let their man take care of them and they'll be. Well, they may also have mom. chosen to have kids. Iris, and take has, care, has, you has know. <laughs> Iris has raising her hand. Iris. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think we all, even men mm -hmm. in some degree, mm -hmm. in certain areas of our life do give away our power. OK. I don't, I, I, I've yet to see a perfect human being who says I have total, absolute control of my life and mm -hmm. I have power over everything. They, maybe they, it's a, it's an illusion. We mm -hmm. all try, but there are certain things that we hold more important and so, certain things that we give up power for. Mm -hmm. For you, April, that's, that's your, 
rub is is those women of that type and then you have other women who for them that's not that's not the main um focus in life i mean it depends but, well here's on... my thing though here's my thing i'm not saying that giving up your power is necessarily a bad thing i'm saying that making a choice and then pretending later that you didn't have a choice is a problem okay Okay. i i have no problem with like if you decide look i yeah i got my degree but i'm a woman should choose you know because there are a lot of things about me that are very conventional i have my man i make him dinner i bring him a plate i like doing it okay i get that but i would never pretend that me doing that was forced on me. I chose it. And mm. if I wasn't happy doing it, I would extricate myself from it. And I, okay. you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying there's not a choice. Isn't wrong. If you want to be a stay at home mom, that's a beautiful thing. Up. That is a beautiful thing. And I, I support it. If you want to say, I want to have an artistic life and not okay. worry about a 401k <laughs> or worry about, you know, a nine to five job. I just want to, you know, see where the world takes me. I got no problem with that. If you're like, nope, I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to get my college degree. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have 2.5 babies. I'm going to, you know, retire <laughs> at 65. I've got no problem with that. What I have a problem with is you making a choice and then not accepting the consequences of that choice. So I think that the difference is that you're not, it's not that you're not accepting the consequences. It's that the consequences stuck and they don't have to stuck. And that's what I'm mm-hmm. saying. But also we've gotten way off track and it's my <laughs> job to keep us on track. So I'm pulling us back in. Really okay. did, but April, All right. That, I love this conversation. So I have a very important, I have a very important question that I want to ask Agnes. Mm-hmm. What is your earliest memory? Oh, oh, because oh, this your is character a... has way early memories, and I do not remember anything before like twelve. Seven. Really? Well, yeah. <laughs> what? So late, Michelle. Well, you know, I probably trauma, but still, yeah. Like, like what? <laughs> what is like? How is how is she remembering things so early? Well, first of all, this is one of the things Gary like pushed back onto the nth degree. Gary, my editor, he was like, no, this is impossible. This can't happen. But in the second book, I knew in my head, I was going to explain why she has this amazing memory. There is an explanation coming in the second book. She She doesn't even know. It's kind of a superpower. Actually, um, uh, Dana Kumar, which is the director of the Congo and the record keeper, he thinks that she does have a superpower. So it is. That's why he wants her. That's why I want her so That's bad. That's so funny. You're, I don't know how you know that, but in the set, anyways, I'm not going to. Yeah, don't give, give it away, away, but I'm like, oh, there's something. He nothing, wants. Nothing, nothing. And she better nothing, not yeah. give her power away, Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. Well, we're not, so not her superpower. <laughs> <laughs> but she, there is an explanation for that. But in, it has nothing to do with me. My earliest memory was some trauma from like when I was six. Actually, what's funny is when I was seven. Oh. So many of my traumas happened when I was seven. I don't know if you guys remember, but Erica was seven years old when this, when the Jones thing happened to her. It's a very uh, traumatic age for her. My oldest That's actually memory like was... the, the Catholic's age of reason too, is seven. <gasps> what? <gasps> yeah. I can't wait to look that up. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. I can't so wait to look that that's up. That's weird. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. when, uh, that's when it's considered that now you're responsible for your own sins. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to look that up because that that means that means a lot to me personally. Yeah. But my first memory, just to answer your question, was um, my father uh, would come home from playing tennis. This is such a weird, but it is drama. My father would come home from playing tennis, and he would drink these Gatorades, these giant Gatorades. Um, and he asked me to go get him some Gatorade, and I put a bunch of Gatorade in the cup. So I always thought, well, he always drinks from the bottle. So he must want a lot of Gatorade. So I got the biggest cup and I put a bunch of Gatorade in and I was seven and I brought it to him. I was like, here's your Gatorade, dad. And he was like, that's too much to put in a cup. He yelled it at me like really loud. I don't know what he was going through that day. Obviously some trauma <laughs> of his own because he was right. like, he looked at me like, and maybe I was, I just heard it that way. Maybe he was like, honey, that's too much to put in a cup. 
But for whatever reason, my seven-year-old self was like, oh my God, I put way too much drink in a cup. And I kid you not, guys, from that day on, I would get a cup this, I, I never like cup, I could never drink out of a cup this big. All of my cups were like very small oh. and I would fill it up halfway. Oh. And I would go back and get more and more and more juice. Whatever I was getting, instead of getting a whole cup, I would get half cups. And it wasn't until I was in college and I was sitting and talking with a friend and she was like, why, why do you keep getting up and getting juice? Why don't you just get a bunch of juice? It seems like you want to drink some juice. And I was like, cause that's too much to put in a cup. <laughs> and she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I'm not sure. <laughs> and luckily I was going through some therapy at the time. And I told my counselor about that. She's like, we need to go investigate this. And that's when I remembered that memory. I didn't even have a memory of it before. So that's, that's my crazy. earliest memory. I had a similar beverage memory. There was a gallon of milk in the fridge and there was maybe an inch in the bottom of it. And I asked if I could have the rest of it. And my mom was like, no, that's too much for you. And I was like, no, uh, it's just a little bit. And, and she was like, okay. And she poured it into a glass and she was like, and you're going to drink every drop of it or you're getting a whipping. And it was way too much for me because, mm -hmm. you know, I was a little kid. So, I mean, it looked like just a tiny bit, but in a gallon jug, it was a lot of milk. And so I had to keep trying to drink this milk and keep trying to drink this milk until, and then I vomited. So uh <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. Terrible. Oh, but that's I, terrible. I had the complete opposite reaction though. And I was like, I'm going to drink whatever I want as much as I want. You know? <laughs> I was so funny. Hey, this conversation. You're not I'm taking like, away my power. Off. Well, exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like that's something like when, if I feel like something is trying to exert power on me, I just, mm -hmm. I can just let it go and be like, I don't care about that anymore. I would rather let it go than let it continue to control me. Okay. Well, that's a superpower, baby, because I, I had the exact opposite. I was like, I can only stay with this. <laughs> just, uh, no, I no, I just, I just want to pour <laughs> you some milk and some Gatorade. We'll <laughs> that we'll that sounds so gross. <laughs> nope, that's going to be our have... next cocktail. No, <laughs> no. The two of you. I have a hybrid. I have a hybrid between the two of you because what it is is that I'm not a rule follower 100%. And if something fails, I was like, okay, it didn't work out. Let's try again something different. And that's how I approach things. I don't. I don't just stop. I just like, okay, let's try something different, you know? And that's I, and I'm so not, reasonable, Iris. You're so reasonable. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's I'm like the like hybrid adult. between the two of you. He's <laughs> like, I'm so healthy. <laughs> well, <laughs> but what's yeah, interesting, though, I think what's interesting, though, is that I do still have the memories, mm -hmm. but I don't that know if I can trust them because, oh. you know, uh, listening to my mom recall That's the same ex yeah. example or my sister mm -hmm. uh -huh. the same event and they're all totally different so we you all know what? remember it's them perspective. i, I yeah. think it's perspective because my friend rachel the neener head is friends with me and she's friends with my sister christy <laughs> and she has heard the same stories from both of us and she's like you guys had completely different childhoods like christy's <laughs> version of the story and my version of the story not at all the same so i think it's just perspective mm -hmm. right yeah. Perception is reality. That's 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 what it is. Perception, however you perceive things, is reality, and that actually is what matters. So, so yeah. So, I want to talk about the audiobook. Okay. <gasps> Did you have any control or say on who gets? Because you got um, Adenrele Ojo, who's like a mm -hmm. two-time Audio Award winner. Like she was nominated amazing. every year. Like, how did you get mm -hmm. her? Well, my audio rights went by auction. I was scraping like the Titan, as amazing as they are, was like kind of the bottom of the barrel because we had to go, my agent and I had to go outside of the United States to get Titan as the publisher. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, now I think my records would be very easy to publish, but when I was publishing it, no one knew what Afrofuturism was. And when I had written it, I, I couldn't even use the word Afrofuturism because no one knew what it was. Oh. And so once, but once my book got published, Black Panther had come out or once my book got, you know, bought by Titan, 
right. Black Panther came had already come out. And so by that time, everybody was looking for Afrofuturism. And so recorded books, audios, it, when my book, my, like I said, it went by auction. An auction means that several different audio publishers wanted to publish the audio rights or wanted to have the audio rights. And so they started a bidding war to see who would get it. And so when you're in a bidding war, you can demand really anything. You can say, I'd like this, I'd like this, so long as they keep bidding on it. And right. so I got, I got over the cover, I got rights over the, like I got final say in the cover, I got final say in the narrator, and, um, and I got a good amount of money for it. A good that amount of sounds advance. like a fun time. So did you oh. get to talk to the narrator <laughs> and like work out like how to say the names of the stuff mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah. oh wow. Ed and Rayleigh, we were emailing each other. We didn't talk on the phone, we emailed. And, but we emailed back and forth several times. She really liked the book and she was really interested in making sure that she was staying close to, you know, how I sort of viewed the characters. And I think she did an amazing job. Oh, she she did. I loved so it. so fabulous. Yeah. Did so they give you a I, choice? Or, or, they, or did you hear different versions? They didn't, hear, I didn't hear different versions of the actual book. I heard different people speaking. So they gave me a choice of, okay, do you like this narrator? And the first two, I said, actually the first two, I want, first two, I said no to the third one. I said yes to, but then she got another gig. And so the fourth one was out in Rene and, and she, and she, uh, she was amazing. So I, I've so listened good. to a, a few things. So, um, so she was the fourth narrator. I think they offered me and they offered one at a time. So it wasn't like you have, I had choices of three. Mm -hmm. They offered one and if I rejected them, I could move on to the next one. Did any so of them have like British accents because they it was so you know because of the mm. what did you say your publishing house in England was? Yeah, it was Titan, but I don't think so. I think all of them were black women. Honestly, I think they were all black women that they were trying to get someone a black female. Well, I mean, to, you know, there's you know. uh, you know, there's black British women too. You know? Oh, you're right. You know, when I say black <laughs> women, I think African American women, but you're right. I meant I meant African American. Uh, well, when but, I said black. But that would have been important to you either way, because even though, you know, this is a fantasy book and and, mm -hmm. and an alternate, you know, world, mm -hmm. it comes very much with that American mm -hmm. black oh, woman yeah. oh, uh, yeah. history of American slavery okay. aspect. And yes, there's been slavery in other parts of the world, other, but, for, but this story probably needed to be told with that voice yeah oh I absolutely 100 percent. there's nothing like quite like american chattel slavery and it's set in georgia like basically physically speaking the book is set in atlanta oh wow well, really so, really i didn't yeah. pick up on that i knew that it was well georgia is essentially like a rainforest isn't it that's the... so funny oh i'd love to talk about the environment in the book but um but no, the reason why is because it's, I don't know, maybe I've just described it. It's, on the, it's all set on the East Coast of North America. Right. So, so I sort of situated the Congo basically in my mind. And I guess the way the picture is drawn too, the Congo is shaped like colonial America. And so it's the Southern part of colonial America. And that, that would be around Georgia. And so well, she see, lives in the we've Northern talked about, part of that. So we've talked that about this in the podcast, what you lose when you listen to the audiobook. And yeah. so I've not seen the map. Oh, you don't get either. that with the audio book. I didn't even look at the map with the audio book. That's okay, the piece that we okay. didn't get. Okay, yeah. So there's a map at the beginning of the book that sort of shows if, you, if you're an American, you should recognize it as the East Coast of North America. And you should recognize that it looks like the 13 original colonies. So I'd take it, I took you back to colonial America. And Erica lives in the Southern region. And she lives in the northern part of the southern region, which would be around Georgia, is what I was thinking. But right. Isn't there like so. a desert? It, there is a desert because in the future world I created, oh, that's right. uh, I sort of. Yeah, I, re, I, I destroyed the world. And then I, um, I. The world is destroyed. And because of the different, uh, the change, the shifts of land, climate has changed too. And so, uh, the, yeah, they basically live in the desert. The Congo is a, basically a, a giant desert. Well, now um, I understand why me asking if any of them had British accents was a weird question. <laughs> oh, no. That wasn't a weird question at all. But, yeah, no, you don't, you don't get the map with the audiobook. No, you don't. I, I mean, yeah, you don't even get, like, a supplemental. Yeah. Oh, so Sometimes you get. Big deal. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a huge part of the book. 
-hmm. And that, so that's a mm -hmm. huge like little clue that we didn't, that we didn't get. I mean, I got mm -hmm. that it was in America. Mm -hmm. but I, I didn't, didn't get where it was. I, I got, got that it was, there was, I was just picturing uh, like, and I'm not good at geography anyway. <laughs> you know, it's very hard for me to picture when I'm reading mm -hmm. about, you know, mm -hmm. the geography of, of something, but I just pictured sort of like, I forget what it's called, but you remember in school, like they thought at one point all the continents were connected and then there was like exactly. tectonic shift. Yes. So I pictured it more like Africa was fitting back up against America mm -hmm. and Europe had come back down and it had all somehow shifted back together. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. For especially once you read Seed of Cain. You'll see why that is incredibly interesting. I cannot. It's wait. not that, but the, but that is a very big deal because basically what happens is the, these giant heavy bombs, I call them, break up the tectonic plates, and so oh. the the everything is shifting around, and so they think they're on the last they think they're on the last remaining piece of land, uh, because everything else is covered by volcanoes and boiling seas. <sighs> But that's don't, say say, so. don't say anymore. Don't okay, say anymore. We're gonna have to heavy spoiler at this point because there's so many spoilers. Like if someone hadn't read the book, oh, this would so I don't right. think they're spoil I don't th I don't think they're spoilers. I think they're teasers. No, I'm talking about the first no, book. No, if somebody no, no, hadn't no, no, read no. So. so one more yes. question. And yes. The whole pandemic that occurred in mm -hmm. the okay. now with what's occurring now. Crazy, I'm, right? Book was prophetic. Published. <laughs> way Pub before that yeah. yeah it was published in june of 2019 mm -hmm. or july of 2019 and then all of a sudden we are now i mean by the time mm -hmm. you know most of the readers have gotten hold of it is during this the pandemic and i was just mm -hmm. curious well, how do you feel about all that you know it's the craziest thing in the world like you guys don't even know because i will not spoil it for you but i was gonna ask what? If we're going to find out more about this virus yes. in the second you book, because I have a lot of questions. Wait, there was, I, a, there was a virus. I thought it was like a technology thing where like the technology went crazy and like an AI took over or something. I don't know, like, because everyone was so afraid of technology. I, I, yeah, yeah, everyone I, I, I have a guess as to, yeah, I have my guess. Oh, I want to hear your guess. I really no, want to no, hear no, your no, guess. No, 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 I won't no. tell you if you're right or wrong. I just want to hear right. it. <laughs> it's just so coincidentally when she was talking with Jones. She mm -hmm. said that they were plant. They had already the workers had already planted the seed, mm -hmm. and no one knew about it, and they got sick. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that happened in the other colonies that started planting the seed as well. Oh my! God. Are artificially grown. So that moment, that moment with the seed when she realizes that it's a bad thing, like that's me. Like every time I have a political opinion. <laughs> like, I swear to God, like I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really great idea. And then someone's like, yeah, but Michelle, what about this? And I'm like, oh no, that right. That's oh bad. my gosh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's me that's every time. Funny. And I was that's like, so, oh. well, I will not tell you, Iris, if you're right or wrong, but you okay. will in the second book find out where the virus is coming from, okay. it, and and why, what's going on with the virus. But you do learn more about that, and it's so interesting because even you guys will know what I wrote in the Seed of Cain. I really wrote the idea of it before coronavirus too. Like right. I didn't like the idea of what is actually happening in the seat of Cain. I knew what, where the virus came from in the record keeper. And I knew I was going to keep it a secret until the seat of Cain. And so once you understand where it came from and you understand the reality of what you're living in, you'll, it's very weird. And it <laughs> happens like that all the time. Like all these things keep happening. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I it's not prophetic, but it's well, very, very I long. truly enjoyed the book and I can't wait for the second one. Yeah, I'm so glad. So glad. So I wondered too, you know, hear about like actors or musicians mm -hmm. that aren't very popular in the US, but overseas they're like mm -hmm. you know, huge. David Hasselhoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you yeah. have like a bigger following in England because Titan published your book? Yeah. They're bigger than America, believe it or not, yeah which is so funny because like if you think American people don't quite understand Erica <laughs> in England they're like I don't get it and I'm like well actually in America so you have to like explain cultural everything oh, wow. um but but they still like you know the thing about Erica is that she her her story is really a human story the story of like we've all talked about having trauma and having to overcome the fear of that trauma to find who you were when you were first born because Erica was born this magnificent warrior 
she got broken down to the shell of herself. And in order to become who God had intended her to be, she had to go heal herself. Mm. All right. So for the bookend, what we are doing is name that book. So what happens is I'm going to tell you what the original title of the book is. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to tell me what the actual title of the book is that was published. Because as we discussed earlier, uh, things change. You know, editors happen, things happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first the first clue I'll give you is the original title of the book. If you don't get it off the original title of the book, then I'll give you another clue, which should be the author of that book. If you still don't get it, I may or may not have an additional um, <laughs> uh, oh, clue gosh, for I you. I get it. Okay, okay. Um, so then, the, if you get, and this is for everybody, so everyone can, uh, it's not everyone can play. Uh, the first, mm-hmm. if you get it, the first one, it's worth uh, ten points. Ooh. If you get it on the second clue, it's worth five points. Okay. If you, if I have to give you more clues, you maybe get two. Agnes, did you ever have an alternate title for the record keeper? Nope, it was the record keeper right out of the day one. Okay, day one. Yeah. Now All I'm right. about to get competitive. I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay, here I go. <laughs> April, you're gonna win. I'll just say that now. I'll just say that now. April, that's winning. no fun. Come on. <laughs> I have a feeling. <laughs> I mean, maybe I, Iris could dark horse it. You don't know. All right. Oh, yeah. I mean, the she dark. drank the milk. Why wouldn't she win? She drank the entire, all that milk, April. How could you? She is She is very competitive, which is why we do this, because it's so fun to see how excited she gets. All right. Okay. So the first one, the original title was called The Last Man in Europe. But they said that it was not commercial enough, so they changed it. Oh, I'm gonna say the man in the, uh, the man in the, um, oh gosh, I forgot Moscow. No, the man in Moscow is that what it's called? Last man on earth. I don't know. No, the man Last in Moscow. Man, yeah, in the messenger. All right, so the, the man with no name. The 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 author's name is George Orwell. 1984. 1984. 1984, April. I said it first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said it first? Because she got the green box. We said it at the same time. She got the green box, though. No, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's so okay. I'll, I'll give it to both of you. Okay. Yes. She's the guest. <laughs> All right. So the next one, the original trying title. To figure out, I'm still trying to figure out that title. Yeah, why is it called that? I don't know. I Okay, we can't get distracted, Agnes. Get your game face on. (laughs) The original title was called Twilight. Oh. Twilight. Was the original title. It's not Twilight? It's not Twilight. It's it's not Twilight. Okay, good. Well, there's Um, a Twilight series, but that's not the name. Are you Googling it, Iris? Are you Googling? No. Iris, we can right. see the reflection. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, Twilight is a like series. No, no, the original. Okay, the so, so, so the author of the original. Well, I would have guessed the first question right away if I was Googling it. That's right. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the original uh, Twilight was written by William Faulkner. Oh, William Faulkner. No, I'm actually trying I to think of what uh, what's Faulkner's favorite famous book. Faulkner. Um, is it bad that I can't even think of a Faulkner book? That it is always... not the book As I Lay Dying. It is not that. Okay, that's the, the book the, I was that was thinking. one that's... that was on the tip of my tongue. My, my mother is a fish. It is not As I Lay Dying. Do you guys give up? Yes. It is The Sound yeah. and the Fury. And the Fury. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So number three. Wouldn't have guessed that. I never read it. (laughs) An original title, because there were several. I'm going to give you most of them. An original title of this book was Tomorrow is Another Day. Gone with the Wind. Yes, Gone with the Wind. (gasps) April, you're so quick with the tongue. (laughs) Why, thank you. Thank you, lady. I knew that one. I get two points because I knew it in my heart. (laughs) Give her the two points. All right, we'll give her two points. All right. The next one. Oh, so so just just for for whatever. Uh, it was also called "Not in Our Stars." Tote the weary load and bugles sang true. These were also other titles of Gone with the Wind. All right. Okay. The next one. The original title was Atticus. Oh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes, To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh. <laughs> you 
want to arm wrestle? It was changed yeah. because the book encompassed more than just the character with that name. Makes so, Makes although Atticus is a really great literary character. So true. We have talked about him on the podcast before. All right. The next one. The original title was The War of the Ring. Grapes of War of the Ring. Oh, uh, ri- uh, Fellowship of the Ring. Which is called what? What is the actual name of the Fellowship of the Ring? Lord of the Rings. Yes, yeah, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> snaked it. She snaked it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> the, original, <laughs> the original title of this book was called First Impressions. Oh. Oh. Pop, pop, pop. Age of Innocence? It was originally submitted by the author's father, but was rejected and so submitted under the new name. First Impressions. Oh, I'm talking, you're talking about What's that book called? It's a movie. First, oh my gosh, it's The Pride and Prejudice. Yes, The Pride and Prejudice. <gasps> yeah. Oh. All right. Oh. And that makes so much sense for that one because the first impression is there yes. is Pride and Prejudice. Yes, that's true. Yeah. All right, the next number seven. And I also have always been confused about who was prideful and who was prejudiced. It's very I think that's the whole idea. That's a very, that's they both, the whole idea. They both were, yeah. They were both. They were both, they both, both yeah. those things. Mm-hmm. That's why they were perfect for each other. You know what I also never really figured out was like sense and sensibility. Like, yeah. I think sensibility back then meant. Was feeling. Sensitive. Yeah. yeah. Like being emotional and yeah. So it's yeah, like being, being emotional and your head, your heart. head and heart. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it took me a long time to piece that together. I, I just, I just piece it together now with you, Tony. <laughs> That's amazing. I teach so many things together in this podcast. Yay! You guys are great therapists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Number seven was originally called All's Well That Ends Well. Oh. Grapes of Wrath. No. And that was All's not All's Quiet on the Western well. Front. Huh? <laughs> All's Quiet on the Western Front? No. All's, All's Well That Ends Well. Oh. Life, life is beautiful. No. Mm-hmm. It was written by Leo Tolstoy. Anna Karenina. No. His War other book. Peace. War and Peace. Oh, exactly. That's what I was thinking I'm of. I'm pretty, pretty sure they made the right call changing that title. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This next one, the original title was Something That Happened. That's riveting. A terrible title. <laughs> <laughs> something that happened. Something that happened. And something um, happens here. Do you want me to? The what it is it ain't exactly clear. <laughs> the author was John Steinbeck. Oh, Grapes of Wrath. Oh, what? No. What? Oh, the other one, Mice and Men. Mice yes, and Mice and Men. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. Oh. That's totally fine. What ifs? <laughs> I, mean, I was distracted. It's fine. This <laughs> this book was originally called What's Noshing on My Leg? Not leg, L-E-G, but <laughs> <laughs> leg, L-A-I-G. What's noshing on my leg? So it's got to be Scottish? German. Oh. <laughs> I don't Lied. know. Is it? it was written Lied. by a gentleman named Peter Benchley. Oh, please. I have no idea. It's a book about a shark. Jaws. Yes, yes. Jaws. Oh. <laughs> what else could it have Angel? been? Was it, what else could be noshing on your leg? <laughs> I didn't even know that That's was a book. A it title. is a book. It's an amazing book. It's very good. All right. So next is The Dead Undead. Oh, something about zombies. Uh, interview with a vampire. Nope. The author's name is Brom, Brom Stoker. Oh, Jack. Oh. Yes, Dracula. I mean, fine, whatever, whatever, okay. fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is the last one. Last one. The book was originally called "Before This Anger." The Grapes of Wrath. Again. The author's name is Alex Haley. I've heard of him. That's a person. Oh, Peaks. Roots. Peaks. Roots, yes. <laughs> oh. All you right. Know, when you said Alex Haley, I thought Aldous Huxley. And I was like, Aldous Huxley, what did he write? But Alex <laughs> Haley only wrote Roots, basically, and, and uh, Malcolm X. So, yeah. Cool. And All the, right, the original so, title was what? Roots. 
But the original before title. Anger. Oh, before this anger. That's awesome. I, that makes sense for like roots. That. The roots like of the that. anger. Yeah. I don't know. I love that. So yeah. also, I didn't put this as I never one. Thought of you, it that way. You yeah. guys would get this. Yeah, with I didn't the, know. Original title of Catch-22 was Catch-11, but they changed it because it was published the same year as Ocean's Eleven came out, the original, and they didn't want it to be confused. Ocean's Eleven was a book? Ocean's Eleven, the original film. Not the new one with George Clooney, but the original. No, that can't be right. Catch-22 right. Catch was written decades ago. So was, mm. so was Ocean's Eleven, the original film. Oh, there was an original film. There was one before George Clooney. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. That's I'll I'll allow it. Okay. Well, I mean it's the <laughs> truth. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So Agnes had uh 10, 20, 30, 42 points. April had 10, 20, 32 points. So Agnes <gasps> cool. I swooped in with roots. Congratulations. You, I'd like to thank Alex Haley for this one. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. You guys are so great. You have to have me back. We would love it. And you know what would be awesome? After yeah. the pandemic, real life. Oh, true, guys. Then, then we can this make you a cocktail. So fun. This was so fun. This is literally the funnest interview I've ever had. Easily. Oh, Easily we'll get you back. Down. And after we've all read um, Seed of Cain. Seed of Cain. Yeah. Yes. And we'll have to remember all the spoilers. Yes. And we'll have to find some drink with milk. <laughs> And Gatorade. No. <laughs> I am vetoing that. There's no reason to have milk and the trauma. No. Trauma. Let's rebuild the trauma. I'm, I'm, it's vetoed. I'm putting my so foot down. There's a rule about that somewhere, I'm sure. Milk. That's so funny. No. It could be like an orange Julius kind of a thing. No, yeah, it could not. Like that. Orange no. Julius's don't have milk in them. And it would help us from getting a hangover the next day because we'd have our electrolytes. Here's, here's, here's what I would allow. Some sort of drink with Gatorade with whipped cream. Ooh. I would allow that. That's on you. Let's do the that. The dairy I feel, like that work. <laughs> I feel like that could work. This, this podcast has been awesome too because we've gone to like deep, dark places. Then we took like curves back to really awesome fun. So That's... I think it's we've, we've run the gamut. So it's awesome. Love well, it. you've been sure. a wonderful guest. So thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of Book Eaters. We hope that you have enjoyed our conversation with Agnes Familia and that you'll run right out and purchase her book and listen to it. And also that you will, you know, maybe learn a little bit about publishing in case you want to go down that path as well. But in the interim, go ahead and eat the books, eat the motherfucker. books motherfuckers. <laughs> Eat the book, so motherfuckers. Eat the book, motherfuckers. I love that. No problem with that. I'm so glad I was here for that. My goodness, yes. Absolutely.